remembrance in a time of worship. It was one year ago this day that I had to stand before this chapel and speak of an unspeakable tragedy. When the jets were rammed into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, when the fourth jet through the heroic valor of the passengers was crashed into an empty field rather than into yet another National American monument. When for the first time in the experience of many of us in this seminary family, America truly was under attack. It is a day we will never forget. It was the second bloodiest day in the history of the United States of America. It is a time when if ever we turned our hearts towards God and said, God, is there a message that you have for us? We all were listening and seeing. It's one year later and much has happened. Much thought and prayer has gone into the preparation of this service. We encourage you to sing with all of your heart. We encourage you to pray with all of your soul. We encourage you to listen with all of your mind. And I encourage you as we go through this day to be remembering those families who've been changed forever because of the horror of this day, to remember our missionaries who are in Islamic countries on this day and probably having a very challenging day themselves, and to remember those who are lost because this day is our reminder of how fragile life is and how quickly life can change. But for the believer, that is not a moment of threat. It is a moment of great joy for our lives, our destiny, everything about us is in the hands of an almighty sovereign God who loves us. Let's join our hearts now in worship of our Lord. Immediately after September 11th, the nation cried out to God, why? Why all of these things happened? What was our answer? Say to those who are fearful hearted, do not be afraid. Lord, your God is strong, and with his might, when you call on his name, he will come and save. He will come and save you. He will come and save you. Say to the weary one, your God will Yes, he will come and save you. He will come and save you. Lift up your eyes to him. You will arise again. He will come and save you. Say to those who are broken hearted, do not lose your faith. Lord, your God is strong with his loving arms when you call on his name. Refuge in the day of 
your God will come and save you. When you call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, God becomes our help in times of trouble. Let's stand together as we proclaim our knowledge of this Lord God. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. O oh God, our help together.
that seem like raindrops on wholesome dreams and plans. Washed upon the seashore with a million grains of sand. Great religious battles for a tiny piece of song. The steering brother in the name of God. Soldiers sweep the nation, looking for someone to blame. No matter how we wish they would, things will never be the same. In times like these. seminary president, 7.45 faculty prayer meeting, 8 o'clock to 9.45 meeting with the administrative council, 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock chapel, 11.15 to 11.45 set up for a trustee committee meeting about new student housing, 11.45 to 2 o'clock meet with the trustee committee and the architects and review all the plans for the new student housing, 3 o'clock at the end of that meeting, Start a meeting with two of the trustees on a matter of a subcommittee within the Board of Trustees, and by 5 o'clock I could start my day. 
just another day in the life of a seminary president. But as we started that administrative council meeting, the knock came on the door, and word began coming in of what happened. And it turned into quite a different day. You never know how much you're going to need that time with God on any given day. You don't know until after you have it or you miss it. If we didn't learn anything else from September 11, we did learn. Keep that walk with God up to date. You never know how much you're going to need it. I'm going to ask Ron Holman, who works with our alumni and student relations, church relations, to come and join me up here and to lead us in a word of prayer as we continue our time of worship and praise. Father, we come to you today with so many thoughts, so many emotions and feelings. Father, so many, so many have given so much. They've lost fathers, husbands, wives, dear friends. But yet, Father, every day we look around us and we see individuals who are struggling for the meaning of life themselves. Whatever their background, whatever their beliefs, and Father, You have equipped each of us to share a beautiful, wonderful story of Your Son. I pray that, Father, today as You comfort each of us and those families, this nation and this world, that, Father, Your sovereignty would reign. But also, Father, I pray that You would embolden us to give us the strength and the courage that in love, that in the right temperament, that we would care forth the mission that you've called us to do. To represent you in a world that is so much in desperate need of your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the privilege, Father, of serving you. I thank you, Father, for the privilege of being in this place, in this day and time, to be used of you. May we be found faithful, Father, and all you've called us to do. As we praise you and worship you, not only this day, but every day that you give us. In the precious and beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We are most delighted to have as our preacher for the day, Dr. Dan Holcomb, teacher of Baptist history and church history. A man with a brilliant mind, a man with a passionate heart for God. A man with a great deal of wisdom and life experience. Uh, not many people have courses that become the stuff of legend, but Dr. Holcomb does. His course on the devotional classics was so popular at the master's level, they wanted to have it as a, some version of the Ph.D. program, so popular in the master's level and the Ph.D. program, they wanted some version of the D.N. program. And every graduate program we have features some way for students to be able to take that course in devotional classics and the cultivation of the soul as taught by Dr. Dan Holcomb. That says a lot about his personal spirituality. It says a lot about his effectiveness uh, as a teacher. Uh, but he is also ministering week by week in pulpits of Southern Baptist churches and has done so much for the kingdom's work. It is a great privilege for us to have a man such as this as a member of our faculty. It's a great privilege for us to hear what God has given him to say for us on this day. After the time of worship, we will hear a word from God through Dr. Dan Holcomb. You noticed in this last year that uh, God's pretty cool. We don't mind talking about God. People don't mind singing about God. Legislators got, legislators got on the steps of the Capitol and sang about God. God bless America. That's okay. When Christians begin to say the answer for the world's ills is Jesus, now that's a different story. That labels us. That tends to isolate us. But we cannot shirk from our responsibility to let this world know that it is Jesus and only Jesus who has the answer to this world's ills. It's good to call out 
in the name of God, on the name of God. But it's only through the blood of Jesus that we can do that. I was glad that Gary wrote that the text of that song that Seminary Chorus sang, Only Jesus Can See Us Through. Let's ask the Savior to be our shepherd this morning as we continue to process a grief, the grief of a nation, but to recognize our responsibility in uh, taking that grief. Let's sing. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Must we need thy tender care? In thy pleasant pastures, lead us. stand together and sing, We are thine. We are thine to thou be friend us. Be the guardian of thy way. Keep thy flock from sin defend us. Seek us when we go astray. Blessed be by the pictures, but we were resolved that uh, it is up to those of us who name the name of Jesus Christ that we have work left to do. But as long as we remain, we grow better, even stronger, though we'll never be the same. Because the ones left standing have to dry all the tears and replay all the memories, the good and bad from the years. And we shoulder the weight of the work left to be done and the ones left standing 
carry on the peace of God will abide in the season of our sorrow in the valley of the pain we can't describe but in the palm of his hand is a shelter from the madness we can never really understand cause the ones left standing have to dry all the tears and replay all the memories the good and bad from the years and we shoulder the weight of the work left to be done and the ones left standing carry on oh, oh, oh and in eternity when all the mysteries are gone it will be clear it was our god keeping us strong cause the ones left standing have to dry all the tears and replay all the memories the good and bad from the years and we shoulder the weight of the work left to be done and the ones left standing carry on and we shoulder the weight of the work left to be done and the ones left standing carry on the ones left standing Carry on, carry on. Thank you, Mr. President, for your generous words of introduction. And I want to follow on those kind words by saying that as tough as this moment has been for me in the process of preparation, I'm just glad to be here. At my age, I'm glad to be anywhere, but glad to be here. And it's with fear and trembling that I try to sort through the major accents of September 11th, 2001, from the context of the seminary family. It has been a true joy for me over these years to be able to serve here, to teach here, to mentor here, to live here, and occasionally to grow spiritually here. I think the role of the confessional seminary, that is, a seminary that believes in something, beyond the superficial accents of humanism or pragmatism or all the other isms that are floating out there in the modern world, to be, to be privileged to represent Jesus Christ personally in terms of vital witness and in terms of theological reflection is a sheer privilege and an absolute necessity in today's world. In case you haven't noticed it, our world is crazy and mixed up. As never before, uh, pluralism is outdoing itself. Someone years ago, a Greenwich Village cartoonist, uh, gave uh, a brief account of a man who was into one of the new expressions of religion, which was based upon ego, based upon self. And he got so much into himself that he forgot who he was. That's the line, the, the text line of that cartoon. For preoccupation with self at any level is always suicidal. It's a joy, a sheer joy to represent Jesus Christ 
and to lead in this worship and to call you to renewal as I call myself to renewal of faith, of obedience, of joy and service. Now, my reflections today are in a twitch between two, to use Paul's expression. It's a tension-ridden commentary, at least as I perceive it, because I want to try to communicate not only love and support and prayer for those who have lost so much and have given so much, but I want us to think together as reflecting Christians. To do theology, as I understand it, is to be able to address not only the tradition of our faith, which is rooted in Scripture, and the major theological writings and exercises of the Christian tradition, but also to be able to address with some degree of intelligence and prophetic insight what is going on around us today. You remember the proverbial way of stating that, a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. There are two visions that clash in my experience as I come to this time of worship. One I have attempted to gather up in some lines from Alfred Lord Tennyson, the great Victorian poet, In his well-known poem, Loxley Hall, it was the setting of Loxley Hall. For many of his youthful musings, in one of the passages, he said, As a lad, I was able to look out into the heavens and get some sense of awe and wonder and meaning from all of that. It was in the context of Loxley Hall that he developed his early friendships. And then there is a pregnant and powerful passage in that poem where he peers into the future far as human eye could see. And he saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be. He saw the heavens fill with commerce, argosies of magic sails, Pilots of the purple twilight dropping down with costly veils. He heard the heavens fill with shouting, and there rained a ghastly dew from the nation's airy navies grappling in the central blue. Far along the worldwide whisper of the south wind, rushing warm with the standards of the people plunging through the thunderstorm, till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled. In the parliament of man, the federation of the world, it is a profoundly optimistic vision of that time when the drum beat and the devastation of war would be no more. Perhaps, It would be in his lifetime. He did not know, but the hope was through human creativity, through the advance of science and industry, and through a disciplined commitment of the essential goodness of humankind, the kingdom would come on earth and we would enjoy a millennium of peace. Well, of course, this optimistic vision of the future authored by Tennyson emanates from the secure and happy environs of Loxley Hall in Victorian England. And in these lines, there is no anticipation of the shocking and horrendous world-shaking realities of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. Two world wars, a Great Depression, a Cold War, a Vietnam conflict, the creation of weapons of mass destruction, racial and religious strife, the apocalyptic mood at the beginning of the 21st century, the many faces of terrorism, and the catastrophic events of September the 11th, 2001. They're all missing. 
I want to read as counterpoint to this vision. Another vision. You see, when you envision religiously or theologically, which is what the theological task is about, when you dare to envision an alternative scenario, may I say a counter-culture scenario, you envision from a source of authority, a source of vision. And you envision from this place. What does it mean so to envision and to proclaim? The alternative vision is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. And I begin my reading with verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Notice the context of the vision, suffering, and involvement in kingdom life and ministry, and in patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see. And send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those churches located in the Roman province of Asia. And I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among them, the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. A marvelous, a somewhat bizarre vision of the victorious Son of Man and Lord of Lords. And now, notice verse 17. When I saw Him, I fell at His feet as though dead. Then He placed His right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. I am the living One. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. I hold the keys. We have seen so many scenes of death and devastation. Compounded is our experience of grief and loss. Even though few of us in this room perhaps were personally related to or associated with those who lost their lives last year, last September the 11th, still there is something of the power of human compassion, a sense of relatedness heightened by the skills of technology that gives us immediate access to places and people and events and circumstances far removed from us. We feel that deeply. But we have to ask, while we survey in these moments those routine and extraordinary expressions of human compassion, of those who rushed into the gap to minister to hurting and dying human beings, we have to assert without apology that greater than altruism and greater than those immediate responsibilities that are a part of our being created in the image of God, there is a ministry that God has given to those who have named the name of Jesus Christ that moves the issue and moves the problem and moves the solution of the problem to a much deeper level. And that is what we must reflect upon and allow to be lifted up 
out of this text. It's a countercultural text. It's a text that, that does not say, Oh, my soul, why would catastrophe or disaster attack me as a Christian? It's a text that says, brace yourself. Being a Christian means a sword as well as peace. Get ready for the battle. Get ready for the conflict. But also get ready to tell the precious story of Jesus and His love and do it with insight and with verve and creativity and the assurance that God indeed gives blessing to this Word. Ellen Goodman is a Boston Globe writer who reflected several days ago about last September the 11th. As she went to work, she said, a plane flies low across the city as I walk to work this sky blue September morning. And I look up, as I always do now, since last September the 11th. It's become automatic since Flight 11 and Flight 175 left my airport on their suicidal, homicidal mission. I follow the plane as it disappears briefly behind a skyscraper and reemerges safely. Then I continue on my way. This pause in my daily routine is no symptom of post-traumatic stress. It's hardly more than a wind. It is my mind's homage to what has changed the most since the Twin Towers fell and the Pentagon was breached and dust came to dust on Pennsylvania soil that is the imagination. The mind can only take so much, you know. And she recalled it on the day when the planes turned into missiles a construction worker as he beheld this scene of destruction unfolding, counted 10, 20, 25, 35, 43 people who traded air for fire and plunged to their death. 43. And the construction worker said it was like a very bad movie. There were some who couldn't believe that these things could happen in our time. It was as if before September the 11th we'd only known terror as a script. And God knows the media are packed with terror, gratuitous violence and sex and destruction. Let me remind you before we make overly harsh judgments about two-third worlds, peoples and their religion that we're importing trash as a country that we shouldn't be importing and leaving false and wrong and destructive signals about who we are and what this great country is about and should be about. And if anything, that should heighten the counter-resurgence of love. The willingness to say, I do to the commission of Jesus Christ and to show the world that while we're ambassadors for Christ, there is a good side and a wholesome side and yes, on occasions, a holy side in our nation. But all you see, we're torn, we're torn as I see it between these visions the bare facts, the stark bare facts of September the 11th are apparent. Six years, eight months. That's the time it took to build the World Trade Center from 1966 to 1973. One hour, 42 minutes, the time it took to destroy the towers from the first impact to the second collapse. One reason why 
We need a counter-resurgence of holy love based upon the victory our Lord Jesus Christ through cross and resurrection and ascension and mediatory glory and coming reigning King one day is that it always takes longer to construct than to destroy. A hundred and eighty miles per hour, the speed at which a Boeing 707 could hit the towers but still not destroy them under the official engineering plan. 470 miles per hour and 590 miles per hour, the estimated flight speeds of the two Boeing 767 jets that hit these towers. What depth of hatred. What misguided zeal. What unholy vendetta revved up the engines of the Boeing 707 to cause such devastation. Isn't this a signal for those of us who claim to know Jesus Christ and to say that love is the very fabric and the foundation of existence? And that the holy redeeming love of Jesus is the most urgent need of humankind today to accelerate in our sense of commitment to love, to love unapologetically, not sentimentally, not in a saccharine way, not dictated to simply by human passion or human emotion, but the love of Christ constraining us, guiding us, filling us, urging us out with the only gospel that will ever bring peace and joy and fulfillment. And I return to the raw data. 0.9. The magnitude of the earthquake-like tremor caused by the impact of American Airlines Flight 11 hitting the North Tower. And then 2.3. The magnitude of the tremor caused by the collapse of the North Tower measured from 21 miles away. The awesome power of science and technology at the disposal of destructive purposes. The counterculture of the Christ says to us in times like these, we need a spiritual upheaval, a magnificent earthquake shaking the very false foundations of our time, the delusions and destructive visions of people inside and outside our nation, not hateful vendetta, not one-upmanship theology, but an expression of holy love for the risen Christ who's gone through the torments and the tortures of suffering and death itself, and has come out victorious. Jesus is risen, has risen indeed. And so we too are called to participate in a holy earthquake, a shaking of the foundation, so that the things that are eternal will remain, and the things that are not deserving and that are destructive will be moved out. I need that in my life. It is so easy for me, especially those of us in this place who are professional teachers, and I use the word professional in the best sense of the word, to get that to, to the point where it comes too easy that the religious words slip off our tongues so readily that the benedictions and blessings and judgments come out automatically, and we get to the point where they have no heart in them. God help us to recover the first things, the first fruits, the first longings, the first dreams, the initial romance of our faith until it plants within us an unquenchable thirst for God, an undeniable commitment to His purpose, a 
throwing back of any semblance of reluctance that would cause us to be less than soldiers of Christian love and of hope. But I must move on. One thing this has taught us, and I'm citing here some of the words of Rabbi Arthur Waskow, a Jewish rabbi who said in reflection regarding September the 11th, we all live, he said, in a sukkah. And he asked, what is a sukkah? It's just a fragile hut with a leafy roof. The most vulnerable of houses. Vulnerable in time where it lasts for only a week each year. Vulnerable in space where its roof must be not only leafy but leaky. Letting in the starlight, gusts of wind and rain. And in the Jewish tradition, in evening prayers, he said, we plead to God. And in translation, the Hebrew reads, spread over all of us your sukkah of shalom, of peace and order. Why a sukkah? Why does the prayer plead to God for a sukkah of shalom rather than God's tent or house or palace of peace? Precisely, he says, because the sukkah is so vulnerable. Now, I've chosen this quotation because it stands in such striking contrast to the vision of Tennyson and others in the 19th century who looked for the creation through science and technology of a kingdom upon earth. It's a kind of modern reiteration of the ostentatious building of the Tower of Babel by which Ancient religionists tried to make their way to God on the basis of technological skill and expertise and physical labor. If heaven doesn't come down to us, we will mount up with our technological power and build a heaven here on earth. And Rabbi Waskow says, we have tried to achieve peace and safety by building with steel and concrete and toughness. Pyramids, air raid shelters, pentagons, world trade centers, hardening, he says. What um, might be targets and like Pharaoh, hardening our hearts against what is foreign to us. But the sukkah comes to remind us we are in truth all vulnerable. If a hard rain going to fall, it will fall on all of us. Enter the Christ. Enter John the Seer on the craggy Isle of Patmos. A hard rain was falling on John. Did that deter him? Did he pack his bags and look for the next boat off that prison island? Not at all. You know what his alternative was? I was on the, in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Think about that. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. That's part of the counterculture message. You've been there. I've been there too. You have come to church out of gas, out of sorts, out of stuff. And you feel of all men most miserable. How are we going to pull off this service? Or for that matter, why are we here? And I've had the experience when with the first note of the organ evoking remembrance of some familiar hymn or chorus, a totally different attitude and totally different atmosphere of spirit takes over. And I forget my limits, as John forgot his limitations on the island of Patmos. And God begins to speak to the imagination and speak to the heart and unfold His Word to us. And we begin to see things that we would otherwise not see and hear things that we would otherwise uh, otherwise not hear and be propelled to do things that we would otherwise not be willing or able to do. That's the countercultural vision of our Lord Jesus Christ. And He saw Jesus. He saw Jesus. I think as basic to any any theological effort, any formal, rational effort on our part to make sense of the sights and sounds and scenes and turmoil of September the 11th 
we need a renewed vision of the Lord. In all of His glory. Not as an escapist vision. Not saying, Lord, show me your purpose and help me to build a little home out far from the madding crowd of the city, far away from torment and far away from temptation and far away from tedium and far away from testing. He'll never do that, but He will give you a sense of His glory and grace in order to equip you for living in this world. Christopher Fry, some years ago, wrote a play entitled Sleep of Prisoners. And there are lines from that play that are among the most popular lines that I, I have read, and I cite it from time to time in messages in my classes, and I think they're appropriate here as we gather to remember and then to hope again, to allow the Spirit of God to renew us again, be reminded in the words of Christopher Fry, that our time is one when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave until we take, hear him now, never to leave until we take the longest stride of soul we have ever taken. Affairs are now soul size. The essential exploration is exploration into God. Now, we have magnificent resources as a nation to explore the heavenly bodies in the realm. What marvels we have achieved fulfilling Tennyson's vision. Medical science advances staggering, staggeringly wonderful achievements. But the problem is we have not matched in the realm of the Spirit the advances that we have made in the realm of technology and science, and therein lies the problem We have powers today to do things to human beings and to human society which without sound, biblical, ethical standards we will turn into procedures of suicide and destruction. Our technology has outrun our ethics. We need a vision of the Christ and a desire to stretch our souls. Now, in conclusion, what does this mean for you and me as we leave this room? surely become more sensitive to the needs of those around us. I would think that ministry begins with those nearest you. Sometimes we romanticize what ministry is about. And we think, oh, if I could just have been there in New York or in the uh, Pennsylvania area where those people were killed in in the crashes, that would be wonderful. But what are you doing in relation to your spouse? And what are you doing in relation to your children? And what are you doing in relation to your classes? And have you ever discovered the library yet? It's a wonderful thing over there where there are marvelous resources available to you. It will just turn you on to the history of the church and the theological insights from great Christian teachers and to uh, information that will blow your mind about what the church can be. Happily under God shall be in your time. Let's address the routine in the name of and for the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, back to the vision and revelation and I'm through. Jesuit Father Louis Espinal was assassinated on March 22, 1980 in Bolivia by paramilitary forces. He wrote this meditation shortly before his death. I'll not read all of it, but it ends with this triumphant vision that I think is expressed so marvelously in the passage of Scripture from the book of Revelation that I've read. He says there are Christians who have hysterical reactions as if the world would have slipped out of God's hands. They act violently as if they were risking everything. But we believe in history, and his assumption is he believes in this because God has not abandoned history. The world is not a roll of the dice going toward chaos. A new world has begun to happen since Christ has risen, the new world of the kingdom of God. The counter-world, the counter-culture. Jesus Christ 
We rejoice in your definitive triumph with our bodies still in the breach and our souls in tension. We cry out our first hurrah till eternity unfolds itself. Your sorrow has now passed. Your enemies, though seeming to succeed, have failed. You are a definitive joy and smile for humankind. We accept the struggle and we accept the death because you, our love, will not die. We march behind you on the road to the future. You are with us and you are our immortality. May that be our prayer and as our hope as we continue to grow and study and think and serve and reach out with compassion to those around us who have gone through troubled waters. I want to ask our President to come to lead us in our closing prayer. Father, we do come in humility before You. Our hearts full of sorrow and grief over the tragic events of a year ago, but our hearts also full of great unquenchable joy because of the kingdom, the unshakable kingdom that is coming and is already present. Father, in a world of so much uncertainty, we do pray that You would energize Your people with a gospel of fact and truth. In a world without moorings, Father, we do pray that the anchor of Jesus will take over the stormy vessels and that You would give us, as Christians, the power of tranquility and the power of purpose and the power of an absolute hope to be Your countercultural force within this world. May we indeed, Father, be energized to be that positive earthquake that will shake the foundations of the world until they give away to the kingdom of Jesus. It's in His name that we pray. Amen.